Harry. In tonight's edition of Reflections, we are going to look at the problems of long-term prisoners. We took our cameras into several prisons, and our first interview is with a man we shall call Harry, although that is not his real name. He spoke to Chloe West about his career in crime. Harry, you're serving a five-year sentence for robbery with violence. That's right. Perhaps you could begin by telling us about your early life. Yeah. Well, I grew up in South London. I was on my own a lot. See, my, my mother used to work down the fish market, and my dad, well, he ran off when I was just a nipper. Did you have any friends? Oh, yeah. All the kids from our street used to meet up at the coffee bar. There was one at the end of the road. We didn't have much money, so we used to hang around there all day. We never used to go to the cinema or dancing or anything like that. We couldn't afford it. What did you used to do there? Oh, we just sat around listening to the jukebox. Nothing special. When did you start getting into trouble? I suppose uh, I was 14. Something like that. My friends used to go shoplifting at Woolies, Woolworths. And one day we were caught. I ended up in Borstal. You mean they sent you to Borstal for, for shoplifting? Well, yeah. After the fourth time. And for beating up old ladies. You used to beat up old ladies? Well, only when I was trying to rob them. You beat them up and then robbed them? Yeah. I used to do that. Perhaps you'd tell me about your life in prison. Well, I suppose the worst thing is being shut up all the time. Yeah. And I can't stand getting up at 5.30 either. I just can't get used to that, even though I've been here more than three years. You see, before I came here, I liked staying in bed all morning. I was on night work, you see. Night work? Hmm. Burglary, mostly. <laughs> I caught you there. I can't get used to going to bed at eight either. Harry... If you don't mind me saying so, a lot of viewers will think of you as an enemy of society. Well, that's fair enough. But I've admitted doing a lot of things. I spent a lot of time thinking. I could keep on stealing things, but I'd end up spending half my life behind bars. I'm going straight this time, don't you worry. What do you intend doing when you get out? I'm very fond of working on motorbikes. I've been studying while I've been inside, and I'm hoping to qualify as a mechanic. Do you think you'll be able to get a job? That's a bit of a problem. People are scared of employing someone with a record like mine. You know, in case they begin stealing again. How will you get round that? I'm planning on working for my brother. He's got a motorbike shop. So you plan to work for your brother? That's right. I tell you, I won't be back. I'm not going to risk wasting another five years. Well, I wish you luck, Harry. Thanks. Medical advice. That was the latest record from Computer Space Travel. 11 o'clock on Tuesday, 17th September, here on the Timothy Old Show on Radio Wessex 206 metres medium wave. And it's time for our medical advice spot. Today's guest is Dr Guy Lines from the Common Cold Research Unit. Dr Lines, could you briefly describe your work? Yes, Tim. We ask volunteers to stay with us at the research centre for two weeks. And we give them a cold. <laughs> you give them a cold? That's correct. Actually, we give half of them a cold. That is, we infect them with a solution of cold germs. Oh. And the other half are given clear, plain water. They're a control group. Our researchers don't know which volunteers have been infected. How do you get volunteers? By word of mouth. It's like a holiday hotel, really. And, of course, only half are infected. Uh -huh. We can then study the effect of different cold treatments. So, have you found a cure yet? Not yet, I'm afraid. Although I'd like to get rid of a few old wives' tales... You get a cold from germs, not from wet feet or cold air or sitting in a draft. What advice would you give to cold sufferers, then? The oldest of all. If you treat a cold, it takes about a week to get over it. Uh -huh. If you don't treat it, then it takes about a week to get over it. <laughs> <laughs> what about aspirin or hot whiskey and lemon? Of course, aspirin or a drink of spirits helps the symptoms. It makes the sufferer feel better, especially if they just go to bed and wait. It doesn't cure it, though. What about your research? We're finding good results from vitamins. Large doses of vitamin C, and I mean five or six grams a day, do seem to help some people if taken at the very first sign of a cold. Mm -hmm. Once it's started, though, it seems much less successful. Vitamins A and B6 also seem to help, 
but we have a lot more research to do. Uh -huh. yeah. Interferon does give good results, but of course it's wildly expensive and we can't really waste the limited supplies we have on coal research. Most of it is being used for cancer research at the moment. Interferon? Yes, I'm sure you've heard of it. <gasps> Wasn't there a program about it on TV recently? There was. <sighs> What's your final advice then? Basically, go home, <laughs> take plenty of liquid, vitamin C certainly won't do you any harm and it may help. Aspirin will make you feel better, but the best advice I can give is rest. Plenty of rest. Oh, thank you, Dr. Lies. Uh, we'll be coming back to you after our next record. It's Daisy Barton singing, You Broke My Heart. Artificial Intelligence Here is an example of Eliza in operation. Men are all alike. In what way? They're always bugging us about something or other. Can you think of a specific example? Well, my boyfriend made me come here. Your boyfriend made you come here? He says I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear you're depressed. It's true. I am unhappy. Do you think coming here will help you not to be unhappy? Youth Culture 1. Introduction In this series of lectures, we shall be examining British society since 1945. Our first topic is youth culture. Now, what exactly do we mean by youth culture? In 1950, a teenager was simply someone aged between 13 and 19. By 1980, the word teenager had developed a much wider and more complex meaning. This was probably because of a whole series of industries which grew up during the 1950s, which were specifically directed at the teenage market. Why should this have happened? The main reason was that teenagers were a section of the community with surplus money, spending money. At that time, people left school at 15 or 16, but didn't usually marry until their early twenties. More often than not, they lived at home in the meantime. Their parents had little spare money. Almost every penny was accounted for, since they were buying a house, bringing up a family, and perhaps saving for a first car or even a first holiday abroad. Because few parents asked their children for realistic sums of money for food and lodging, the kids had money to spend. Consequently, Industry wasted no time in finding them something to spend it on. We shall go on to look at some of the resulting changes in existing industries and also at some of the new industries which sprang up. 2. Cinema One of the first changes was in the cinema. During the 1930s, the average person saw two films a week. By 1960, this had been reduced to 12 films a year and the current figure is less than half of that. The cause of the cinema's decline is obvious. Audiences fell as a result of the increase in television ownership. In fact, a similar increase was happening in other countries for two reasons. First, the general world economic recovery from the war. The second reason was that technology was making mass production possible and therefore sets were becoming cheaper. The effect of this was that the cinema lost its family audience. Because families were smaller, and because they often lived in different areas from grandparents, the cinema had become an expensive night out. There were no free babysitters, i.e. grandparents. Of course, many cinemas closed, and the ones which survived were the ones in the town centres. Therefore, cinemas became more expensive to get to, and in consequence, audience numbers declined even more. The end result was a cinema aimed at the youth market, 16 to 25. This meant different kinds of films, and in the end, an even greater loss of the family audience. 3. Fashion Another area of change was fashion. Styles have always changed, but the change has usually been slow. A man's suit of 1925 would not have looked out of place in 1950, or in 1985, because they were made of natural materials, such as wool, silk, or leather. Clothes had been an expensive item for the family of the 1920s or 1930s, and high fashion was positively undesirable. 
Due mainly to changes in technology, clothes today are much cheaper. That is, they cost a much smaller percentage of our income. Man-made fibers and mass production are the basic causes of these reductions in real price. The first consequence was that people could afford to buy more clothes more often because they didn't have to wait until clothes were almost worn out before replacing them. Man-made fibers are hard-wearing and long-lasting, as well as cheap. The clothing industry did not want to lose sales, so the idea of fashion was promoted more heavily, especially to the youth market. One result of a national TV network was that new fashions in clothes, dance or music spread rapidly throughout the country, and this led to even more rapid changes in fashions and styles. In contrast to the man's suit of 1925, which would look normal today, look at the fashions of 1956. 4. Pop music Perhaps the classic example of youth culture is pop music. There has always been music which is popular, but until 1950 or so, popular music meant the music of the working classes. Since 1955 or thereabouts, we have had pop music which is classless. A musician might tell us that the causes of pop culture are complex. He might say modern pop music is the result of a mixing, a a blending of black American rhythm and blues with white American country and western music. We are interested in the effects of pop music, and no account of its origins can explain its worldwide popularity. This is almost certainly due, once again, to changes in technology. I would say that pop music as we know it is a direct consequence of the invention of the transistor. Uh, the transistor gave teenagers their own source of music, which was cheap and portable, that is to say, the transistor radio. As a result, teenagers were freed from the family radio, broadcasting bland music for a family audience. A demand was created for specifically teenage music, and, as usual, industry responded. At the same time, the invention of the 45 RPM vinyl record, which was almost unbreakable, led to greatly increased record sales. 5. Other Entertainments The new youth audience were too young to go to the traditional British pub because of British drinking laws which forbid the sale of alcohol to under-18s. In the United States, the drinking age was 21. This was a result of the Prohibition era between 1919 and 1933, when alcohol was totally forbidden. So again, there was a market kids looking for somewhere to meet, and again there was a response. Coffee bars and milk bars began to open all over the country in the 1950s on account of this demand. Like pop music, an American model forms the basis. The pubs were left to the older males, the tea shops to the older females. Another effect, a side effect of this Americanization, was increased consumption of coffee. In 1945, Tea was the normal British drink. By 1965, tea and coffee consumption was almost equal. 6. Summing up So, the main areas we shall look at are the cinema, next week, fashion, the week after, pop music, the week after that, and finally, other entertainment, in the last lecture in the series. There are some other manifestations of youth culture, most of them a consequence of industry's response to a group with surplus money. I shall just mention a few of them. Motor scooters became popular here, as British kids, unlike their American contemporaries, could not afford cars. The scooter was not really suitable for Britain, on account of our weather and the resulting slippery roads. Thousands were sold. Another reason being that you could ride a scooter at 16, a year before you could apply for a car license. A huge cosmetics industry grew up, with massive advertising to make girls buy cosmetics which became very cheap. Why? As usual, the price resulted from new technology and synthetic ingredients. Magazines directed at the youth market were published in large numbers too. The same forces as ever were at work on this, the first TV generation. 
Because of their spending power, the concept of teenager, in inverted commas, was developed. However, in the 1950s, their spending power was still controlled by traditional industries. In the 1960s, things changed. But that's the subject of another lecture. Strong language. Oi, you! I was waiting to back into that space. Were you? Bad luck, mate. Uh, but, but I was indicating. I've been here for ages. Well, you were too slow, weren't you? Look, I'm not letting you get away with this. You'd better move or else. Or else what? Or, or else I'll... Clear off, chum. I haven't got time. <sighs> You'd better watch it. Leave it, mate. Don't be so stupid. Just watch it or I'll... Will you? You and whose army? Right. Come on, then. I'll give you one. Is that a threat or a promise, darling? Look, I'm off. I haven't got all day. Come back here. I'll... I'll... Excuse me. Miss? Over here. Miss? Yeah? I wonder if you'd be kind enough to get me a size 18 in this. If it's not too much trouble, that is. 18? We don't do extra large, love. Sorry. You want the outsize department. Well, what have you got in size 18? Eh? I thought I told you. We don't do extra large in anything. All right, but there's no need to be so unpleasant, you know. I say, I'm talking to you. I said... Oh? I am sorry, madam. I didn't want to upset madam, did I, madam? I was listening to madam, madam. And another thing. I'm going to ring your mother and tell her to stop interfering. Look, she's only trying to be helpful. Helpful? She phones every day to see if you've had enough to eat. I mean, for goodness sake. We have been married three years. Anyway, I'll tell her next time. Don't you dare ring her. Look, Martin, I'll do what the hell I like, OK? I'll never forgive you if you upset her. Sh she worries, that's all. Upset her? What about me? I'm just going to tell her, very politely, to mind her own business. You... you dare? You'd better not try and stop me either. I've had enough. I warn you. You phone her, and that's it. That's it. That's it. What the hell do you mean, that's it? I, I tell you. I'll leave if you do. Leave? Run home to Mummy. Don't threaten me, Martin. I couldn't care less what you do. You... you... Hello, hello. Where's the fire? Sorry, I don't understand. You seem to be in a bit of a hurry, sir. I wondered if there was an emergency of some kind. No, no, no emergency. In that case, I'd better see your licence. You have got a licence, I suppose? Yes. What do you mean? Oh, it's just the way you were driving. I wondered if you'd passed your test, that's all. Very funny. Here it is. Right. David Humphreys. Mm -hmm. What's your date of birth, David? 9th of the 7th, 57. That's right. OK, Dave, get out of the car. What? Come on, Davy. I think we'll just take a breath test, eh? Look here, officer. I have not been drinking. I'm sure you haven't, Dave. But the test will settle that, won't it? I don't like your attitude, constable. I mean, all I was doing...